Good afternoon. My name is uh, Adam Olson. I'm the member of the Legislative Assembly for Saanich North and the Islands, and I'm joined today uh, by my colleague Sonia Firstenau, MLA for Cowichan Valley, and author and futurist Alex Su Jung Kim Pong. I have that pronunciation correct, don't I? No, perfect, Adam. No, great oh, to be excellent. with you. So we are uh, hanging out uh, today and having a conversation uh, about a topic that uh, has captured, I think, the attention of a lot of people uh, as we uh, begin the recovery of uh, post-COVID, post-pandemic, and that's the four-day work week. And uh, it's an issue that, uh, that I think, Sonia, you initially raised here in British Columbia in an, in an interview and maybe provide a little bit of background in that and then we can get to uh, Alex. Sure, Adam. Uh, it was uh, after, actually it was after Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern had raised it as an idea in New Zealand, where there are uh, some great examples of companies that have switched to a four-day work week. Um, and then the media reached out to me because I had brought it up uh, previously. And it has garnered a great deal of interest, not only here in BC, across Canada. And as we saw yesterday on the seminar that I watched with Alex around the world. Um, and as we rethink some very old ideas about how we work and uh, how we achieve productivity and well-being in our workplaces. So uh, it's great to have Alex here with us and I'm really keen to hear what he has to say. Yeah, Alex, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to, uh, to the audience and then uh, I know you've got a little bit of a presentation about your book, mm -hmm. Shorter, and I'll let you uh, slide right into that. Excellent. So, um, you know, I am, first of all, it's sort of great to be, uh, be here and sort of, uh, sort of talking to you, and I really appreciate the invitation. So, um, you know, I am, uh, for the last 20 years, have been working as a consultant and a futurist in Silicon Valley, mainly working with um, sort of companies and governments on technology forecasting and scenario planning, trying to get a sense of how new technologies, economic changes and so forth, sort of create policy challenges or strategy, strategy challenges that we can anticipate and to try to plan for. Um, and, but I've also had a second life as an author and the last couple books that I've written um, have dealt with Kind of the role of kind of rest and leisure time in sort of super creative and super productive lives. And more recently, looking at organizations that have taken sort of insights from neuroscience and psychology about the role of rest and actually brought them into their companies and have shortened their sort of, uh, and as a result, have shortened their work weeks. So I thought it would make sense to to explain, uh, to walk through a little bit of sort of that work as a way of providing sort of an intro, uh, of sort of answer, I think probably answering some of the basic questions that a lot of people have about the four day week, why it works, what its benefits are for individuals and sort of for companies. So I got started on this when uh, a few years ago, I was, uh, I'd realized during a sabbatical that I actually had at uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge, that you know I was getting an awful lot of stuff done. I was reading, I was writing great stuff, but I didn't feel the kind of time pressure that I normally do um, here, you know, or if it, it, here in the tech epicenter of the world. And it started me thinking about the relationship between overwork and productivity. And I, and when I started diving into this, I found that, you know, in contrast to the way that we assume you have to work in order to do great stuff, that a lot of history's most productive and creative people, people like Charles Darwin, um, sort of seen here at the Natural History Museum, actually labored far fewer hours per day than we think are necessary to do good work. And they invested much more heavily in leisure activities and downtime than we might expect from people who were super serious, who were obsessed with their work, who are often you know, locked in um, battles over uh, to, you know, to discover the next great thing. And what this led to was 
my last book, which was about the role of rest, the hidden role of rest in the lives of creative people and how certain kinds of leisure activities and hobbies turn out to help us be more productive, to be more creative, and to have longer and more sustainable sort of creative lives. Now, a lot of that was looked at historical characters. And I think one of the things, and it's very easy to think that in today's, you know, sort of hyper busy world, that that kind of way of working is, even if it's not obsolete, um, is very difficult to reach. We get an awful lot of signals in the world that tell us that, you know, overwork is a kind of necessary precondition for doing good work. And so what I was interested in doing in this book was explaining how it is that some really innovative companies have managed to reduce their working hours, moving to four-day weeks, to six-hour days, or even sometimes five-hour days, without cutting salaries, without cutting productivity or profitability or alienating clients. And I looked at more than 100 companies around the world. Um, and since finishing the book, I've discovered almost another 100 who have adopted this since then. So this is, this is actually a global movement that is continuing to build. Um, they range, they are, uh, they're located all over the world and they range from kind of creative and design agencies or advertising firms to factories, to sort of manufacturing, um, and they are genuinely global. One of the biggest companies doing this is an e-commerce company in Korea called Wuwa Brothers, which is sort of the equivalent of DoorDash. And they've got about, about 2,000 or so people working for them now. And they're a multi-billion dollar company. And they've become a multi-billion dollar company working a shorter work week. Now, part of the reason that they're able to, uh, to reduce working hours is that studies have found that um, the, the combination of distractions, multitasking, interruptions, meetings, cost us about two hours of productive time every day. And so that means that if you can get a handle on uh, just on those things, you can go a long way to being able to do five days worth of work in four days. And the way that the companies that I've looked at manage this is that one of the, they do a few relatively simple sounding things. One of them is they make meetings a lot shorter, right? Those standard hour long, all hands, weekly meetings turn into, you know, 10 minute standups. Um, meetings become a lot more focused. They tend to become shorter and also smaller. Um, so companies become a lot more thoughtful about how to run meetings and who should be in them. Another thing that they do is they're a lot more thoughtful about how they use technology. There's the, or they will do things like um, implement rules to check email twice a day rather than to have, uh, to be constantly online. Um, you see a lot of noise canceling headphones in, sort of in these offices. They also will redesign their work days to carve out time for super focused work where you can be a little antisocial and you can be heads down and, and concentrate on your most important stuff and time for you know, clients, for phone calls, for meetings, and then sort of time to be social. So this is a company in England called Flock. They're a design agency and they have what they call red time, which is heads down, um, green time, which is for breaks, and then amber time for or meetings and or uh, and uh, and sort of meeting up with clients and so on. Um, they're actually pretty strict about this. Other companies are a little less so. Um, it really depending upon the particular needs of sort of of your industry and sort of your company or your department. Now, so. What happens in these companies? Um, do they actually manage to, or to, to do five days worth of work in four? And what effect does it have on 
you know, key metrics like productivity and profitability. Well, um, first off, virtually none of the companies that I interviewed this talk about revenues ever going down. And indeed, it's often the case that revenues go up, um, sometimes very substantially. This is a graph showing Wuwa Brothers um, from 2015 when they moved to a 37 hour week um, to 2018 when they, after they had implemented 30, a 35 hour week. You can see that their revenues went up more than tenfold in this period. Um, there are also dramatic improvements in not just sort of personal, you know, personal health or sort of work-life balance, but also within companies. People talk about being happier with their work, being better collaborators, having better relationships with their peers. So this is from IIH Nordic, which is a design company in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And you can see from 2015 to, or fairly to, I think, the beginning of 2020 or so, um, this is a measure of their relationship with peer score. This is one of a number of things that they track on a weekly basis. And you can see that over time, this has gone up, gone up remarkably and, stay, and, and has stayed very high for, for quite a long time. And then finally, um, one last example is the results of a happiness survey taken at a company right before they implemented a four-day week and then six months later. And you see here that the number of people who describe themselves as very happy with their jobs, right, giving it a nine or a 10, goes from 12% just before implementing the four-day week to about 50% after. And one of the concerns that people often have when they, when they talk about a four-day week is, well, isn't it gonna be more stressful? right? Because you're having to work faster, you're having to do more in less time, won't people become less happy? And this suggests that that actually is not the case. One of the other remarkable things is this line right down here at the bottom um, about can you keep up with the work? Before the four-day week, 50% of people said that they were able to keep up with the work. Six months later, working a four-day week, nearly 80% said that they had enough time to get all their work done. And so that gives you a sense of you know, the degree to which in you know, ordinary companies, there is the combination of distraction and multitasking actually creates a sort of time pressure and a sense of time poverty that goes away when you redesign the workday and you give people concentrated time to really sort of focus and work. And then finally, a word about the impact on clients. You know, you would think that this is, that, you know, customers and clients would really dislike this. Um, and this is the great worry that nearly everybody who trials this has. But in fact, clients turn out to be some of the biggest supporters of companies that move to four day weeks. And it's and partly because you know they they themselves have issues with work life balance and stress and burnout, and so you know they see companies that are trialing four day weeks as kind of developing solutions that they might be able to adopt themselves down the road, and so and I think that they and another important thing is that they come to see the ability to do this work in less time as a sign, not that this company is less dedicated, but that they are really, really good at their jobs, right? The fact that, you know, that, that this company is able to get these, get these complex projects done working a four day week while another company needs, you know, six days and a couple weekends to do it really tells you not that they are, you know, that they're slackers, but they're outstanding with their time and they really know their business. So it comes to be a sign of sort of legitimacy and professionalism and dedication rather than the opposite. The other thing is that this represents this, you know, 
these start off as solutions to very practical kinds of problems. You know, founders feeling like they're going to burn out if they don't make changes or problems with recruitment and retention. But it turns into a kind of deeper shift in the way that people think about time and work and productivity. It's also something that's starting to spread elsewhere into sort of uh, outside of you know, outside of companies to governments to educational institutions and elsewhere so obviously you know in british columbia there's been a discussion about this recently um, in nova scotia in the town of guysboro i think it is um, uh, the municipality just recently started a trial of a four-day week there have likewise been um, towns and counties here in the United States that have implemented four-day week trials. It's also something that we're starting to see in medical schools of all places. Um, Stanford University moved to a four-day teaching schedule last year, and University of Miami is going to implement one in the fall. And the idea here is that you, by giving people Wednesdays off, and organizing the teaching schedule into two two-day blocks where you come organized around you know, sort of clinical problems that involve a combination of laboratory work and lectures and time in the hospital, that you're able, this offers students an opportunity to dive really deeply into sort of technical and medical problems um, to learn faster, but also to have time off so that they can you know, basically have a little bit of a life and be less stressed and less prone to burnout. And then finally, companies are also starting to look at the four-day week as one piece of a strategy for reopening and returning to work more safely. What I'm showing right now is a map of a call center in Seoul, Korea, and the blue indicates um, people who caught coronavirus. What this shows us is that open plan offices with their recirculated air and their common surfaces and you know, lots of glass and plastic turn out to be as popular with viruses as they are with architects. And one of the things that we're going to have to figure out as we reopen is how we can open these, sa open these spaces safely so that you know, your company doesn't become the next hotspot and you also can guarantee or reassure your clients or your customers that when they visit you, you know, it's gonna be a healthy experience. It's also the case that moving to a four day week helps companies become more resilient, more creative, better able to solve challenging problems, which is, a, which is a capacity that I think every organization is going to need in the future. Because you know, with coronavirus, we are not at the end of the movie, right? We are, the epidemiologists agree that we are at the end of the first season. This thing is gonna come back. It's gonna come back at the same time as flu season probably. And I think if we are better able to figure out how to adapt businesses, how to adapt services and products, adapt our working spaces. We'll be able to respond more quickly with less disruption, close down faster when we need to, reopen sooner and more safely and more certainly. And a four day week will help make that possible. So um, here are my coordinates. Um, and so if you're, if you're interested in learning more about the four-day week and how companies companies uh, put it into practice. Um, you know, I will recommend my book and then also my website where I continue to talk about other companies that are doing it, as well as other efforts by governments and other institutions to think about put it, uh, about how to support the four-day week. So, um, with that, I will stop the presentation and say thank you. And you know, we should open it up. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for that. There's just so much to kind of dig into here. And in addition to what came up in the presentation yesterday, one of the really imp interesting things that Margaret Cox from the Ice Group in Ireland mm -hmm. has switched to their, they call it the three-day weekend company. Right. Yes. Um, is 
uh, a few things she brought up. One is that your customers are never happier than your staff. Mm -hmm. right? So by investing, as she put it, in the well-being and happiness of their staff, they've actually ended up with happier customers. And they had great amounts of stats about the productivity, just as you've shown with these other companies. I guess where I want to start is, is a bit more on a negative thing is, have you looked at the cost of burnout? Hmm. Well, you know, there is a, there is a fantastic book about this called Dying for a Paycheck um, by a guy named Jeffrey Pfeffer, who argues that burnout has become, in the United States at least, as big a public health problem as smoking. When you measure the effect of overwork and burnout on you know, chronic health issues, uh, you know, the, or the, the, the psychological costs, the costs for long-term mental, uh, mental health, it turns out to be a huge thing. Now, in companies that move to four-day work weeks, I think it's generally the case that they manage to kind of increase the tempo of their work without creating a huge amount of stress by doing a couple things. First of all, these are all companies in which employees themselves take charge of redesigning their work, of figuring out how to use technology more effectively, of figuring out new schedules. As one founder put it, you know, I've hired really good people and I don't know their jobs well enough to tell them how to do it in four days. I've got to let them figure it out. Having that control over your job goes a long way to giving you a sense of con of confidence and sort of and reducing your re and reducing your sense of stress about changing it. I think another thing, the the second important thing is that you know that that slide of flock schedule where they have red time and they've got green time, sort of social time, is a kind of uh, embodiment of something that a lot of these companies do, which is they have you know, these really focused periods, but they also have highly social periods. You know, even though you get rid of those like 10 minute conversations around the water cooler or you know, the few minutes at the beginning or end of a meeting where you're chatting about last night's game, you don't do that so much in these companies. You do, you know, you do stuff like have lunch together or go out for a hike together on Fridays. And, and essentially what you do is you make the work time more focused on work and you make the social time more focused on, you know, on people. Mm -hmm. And that goes a long way, I think, to reducing stress levels in the office and building a sense of cohesion and common purpose. So um, long, long, long answer to a really simple short question. That's I, funny, if, Adam, if I can just jump in with one more and then I'll pass it to you. But you know, sure. I've been, I'm reading your book, Rest. Adam's reading shorter, then we're going to swap. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. But it, it's evoking for me a time in my life when I was uh, doing my master's degree at UVic and I was at a center. Uh, it was called the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. I was a single parent. I was working. I was teaching. I was taking on my coursework, I was writing my thesis, and yet I look back on this as one of the most wonderful times and, and enjoyable times of my life. Hmm. At the center, we had a daily routine. So I would get my son to school and then get in and do my first hour and a half, two hours of really intense work on my thesis or my classwork, whatever it was. And then we had coffee time. And that was at 10.30 till 11. And all these scholars from around the world, we'd all gather in the library and we would talk about what we were working on. Mm -hmm. And I learned some of the most amazing things. I mean, I'd talk to astrophysicists or biologists or religious scholars. And then, we, you know, a bit more focused work time, lunch, focused work time. And then I had a pillow under my table. I would climb under there every day at about three o'clock and have a 20 minute nap. And the director of the center came through one day with sort of on a tour and he said, Oh, that's our graduate student, Sonia. She always naps at this time of day. And, and, you know, reading the book and how in, in your book, you lay out how people uh, have these routines that was so effective in that time of my life to achieve, you know, to get so much done. And uh, it really resonates uh, what you've written about. And I'm, I'm, really grateful for it. And I think that this is the one thing is that we've forgotten how important the routine and the leisure are yeah. in our lives. No, you know, and I would say for the, that, you know, what you're describing is 
a routine, you know, first of all, yes, that routines are super important, but also that, if, you know, what you're, what you're talking about is a routine that sort of kind of layers periods of intensive work with breaks. It is a little bit like high intensity training in, you know, in the gym. And that turns out to be a super effective way to effectively do creative and knowledge work. Um, and so I think that's great. And then the last thing that I would point to is that, you know, you're describing being able to build a routine in an institution whose culture would support that kind of work and, you know, that way, that way of working and that way of spending your time. And it is really, really essential, I think, that sort of companies, that uh, you know, educational institutions, that governments um, provide that, you know, be places in which it is possible to work in these ways, rather than places that assume that, uh, that, uh, that the, o that the o only route to success is by you know, making people work enormously long hours, um, by privatizing the costs of overwork and burnout, and assuming that you know, if you lose someone, you can just hire another person, and you know, it's all, it's all going to be, it's all going to be fine for the organization. So, um, yeah. One of the things in in your uh, the answer to the first question, as well as in your book, uh, is is very clearly illustrated is the kind of leadership that is within the organizations that adopt a four day work week is is. Um, very modern, forward-looking kind of leadership. I think it's a it's a certain style. If, if I, you know, you do a very good job uh, in shorter, letting the the leaders speak for themselves, or you put voice to to what they're saying about their they the how a four-day work week has evolved within their workplace, and and um, the kind of leadership that it takes to be able to work with and to trust your your team and your team members to be able to define how that's going to work, I think is, is a really key part of this. And, you know, I'm, we're interested in this from a, a public policy perspective, you know, from a provincial government, you're talking about uh, civic governments are, are adopting it. But one of the key pieces to this, and I just like for you to, to maybe share some of the experiences that you outline in, in the book with respect to the kind of leaders and, and, the process that they allow to kind of organically unfold within their organizations over a period of time so that then they can bring people along and that people can get comfortable with it and then it can become part of the lifestyle and the culture of the organization. What kind of leadership fosters that? Sure. So first off, I think that the, the, these, are, uh, these are people who themselves have backgrounds where they've, you know, Left, you know, left school at 16 and gone into the restaurant industry and done 15 years of, you know, 80 or 90 hour weeks themselves before, you know, owning their own restaurant and, and, you know, going to 100 hour weeks. So, you know, or they've worked at McKinsey or you know, big advertising agencies or other places where overwork is very much the norm. So, you know, I very consciously decided to focus on, on or of those you know, industries where, where overwork is really common, not like, you know, guys, you know, selling beads out of a van down by the beach, right? These aren't people who adopt four day weeks mainly out of a desire to have like a cool lifestyle. These are people who actually really like their work and they want to be able to keep doing it for a long time. And they often, they often reach a point where they, where they think, because of a health crisis, because of a brush with burnout, that if we keep working this way, this place is gonna fall apart in the next couple of years. We've gotta make some dramatic changes. Sometimes that's a personal thing. Sometimes it's, you know, they lose half their staff over the, over the course of a year, or there's something else that triggers that sort of change. So, you know, it's people, so, you know, I think that, uh, that everybody has this moment where they realize that they've got to be serious about making these changes. They also tend to be a little bit rebellious. Um, they are confident that they know how to do this kind of work, but they also know how to do it better. 
right? They think, or if I hear lots of stories about how, you know, the way that the industry normally works is actually kind of stupid. And I figured that out a long time ago, and this is my chance to show them how to do it right. And so that kind of rebellious sensibility and confidence that they can actually come up with something better is another ingredient that I see. And then I think they have a genuine care for their employees, right? These are often places where um, you're higher, where, you know, they're smaller companies often in, you know, outside of major cities. So they are, they are either competing with very big companies or they are competing with, you know, sort of Toronto or San Francisco or London for really outstanding labor. And so they have to do something in order to attract people of a really great caliber. Now, once you do that, and so the four day week is one way to bring in people who otherwise, you know, would never think of leaving, you know, New York or Houston for a job in, you know, someplace that they've never thought of, or maybe going back to the little town that they grew up in. The way, now, once you get into it, the way that you kind of bring people along is, first of all, I think making clear that there's a kind of social contract here, that if you, you know, if you're able to figure out ways to save time at work, you get to keep that time for yourself. That provides an incredibly clear incentive to people, really clear feedback on a day-to-day -day basis about how they're doing, and kind of establishes that you know, these changes are not just about let, you know, making more money for the company, it's about making a better life for everyone. The second important thing, I think, is genuinely giving them the autonomy to experiment with how they do their work, how they use technologies, how groups organize, giving them a chance to try a lot of new things and failing at some of them. And then, and then when you succeed, sharing those successes with everybody else. Um, and those are, you know, those are easy things to say. And I think probably a lot of people have heard, you know, heard exhortations to do that kind of thing sort of before, but the results really are amazing. Um, one person, you know, one person I interviewed said that when he implemented a four day week, you know, everybody started acting like they owned the place. And, you know, all I did was give them a day off. And, but they felt, you know, they felt engaged by the challenge. You know, they felt they, you know, they had clear reasons for doing it. They had an incentive to kind of work with everybody else to do it. And it was, you know, it was a way to sort of spark a degree of inventiveness and creativity and experimentation that, um, you know, I think any smart manager would love to see in their employees. So that's how you do it. Actually, in the end, you probably got, gave them two days off because uh, they're, they're able to take that third day and, and do the things that you scramble around for the personal uh, business that needs to be taken care of and then actually be able to, to uh, take a day off, uh, take, a, take a rest. And then, you know, because the, the second day of that weekend, you're almost uh, certain to be preparing for the next work week. So, you know, it, it's incredible uh, how, how uh, the, the impact of that third, of, of that third day in a, in a three-day weekend. Sonia, you know, do you have? Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. No. I, that's, that's exactly right. You know, um, when you ask people what they do with this extra time, um, you know, part of it, a, a good bit of it is like life admin stuff. You know, that's when you schedule the, you know, the repairman coming to fix the dishwasher or dentist appointments or things of that sort, which means that you've got the weekend free. I mean, genuinely, genuinely yours. And then, you know, what you do with that free time is you care for things. Um, people, there's a lot of self-care. People go on hikes. They you know, start exercise routines. They're cooking better. People also talk a lot about spending more time with family and also doing more volunteer work. Um, nobody talks about, you know, going out and doing a three-day bender now. Um, people are surprisingly thoughtful about how, about how they spend their time. Um, the, you know, the one thing that comes close to this was um, in a Scottish call center, 
the first few weeks that they, after they went to a four day or a four day week, the managing director noticed there were a few guys coming into the office on Friday morning, doing a couple calls and then disappearing. And after, after several weeks, she asked, she cornered one of the guys and asked what was going on. And he said, well, to be honest, we haven't told our spouses that we're only working four days. So we're coming in and, you know, and then we're going off and going to the pub or playing football or doing something. Um, so, but, you know, the, the, I think the upside of that story is that, you know, it's another illustration of how, you know, of how a four day week can make social life within a company and friendships within a company, um, you know, sort of even stronger and better. Well, yeah, so, so Sonia, you were about to say. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point because it's one of the things like we've talked about even in our, our workplace about wanting to socialize a bit more, but nobody has any time outside of the work hours, yeah. right? Yeah. One of the things that a lot of people bring up, and I see it in, in comments that Adam's gotten, um, and I know that you've heard this a lot, is this concern that, okay, we'll go to a four-day work week and I only get paid 80% of my salary. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that specifically about the companies that have changed and, and how they've addressed that? Right. Okay. So certainly there are companies that will reduce work, offer a reduction in working hours that's prorated. Those are companies, though, that are not making the kinds of organizational changes that I'm talking about. The com all the companies that I have studied, and you know, this, this includes you know, well-funded software startups and garages or restaurants, what they're doing is they're reducing working hours, but they're not cutting salaries. So this, and indeed, I think that in order to get the level of work the level of kind of personal investment that you need in order to make this work, it cannot be a cost cutting move. Um, and I think that the, so you know, the, it, is, it is not the case that you can do it this way and sort of save, you know, and save money on salaries. Now, it's also not the case that even if you have, you know, move from eight hour to six hour shifts, in let's say a hospital or a nursing home, that actually costs you less money than you expect. Um, I've got a nursing home that has put, uh, put certified nurses assistants, you know, the people who spend a lot of time with residents, help them get dressed, organize activities for them. They went from working eight hour days to six hour days, but they were still paid for 40 hours a week, assuming they met certain benchmarks. And what they found was that you know, this is a tough job that often doesn't pay very well, and so there's very high turnover. But in this nursing home, turnover plummeted so far that they saved so much money just on not having to pay, rec pay for recruiters, job advertisements, or, you know, the temp or to pay the temp agency when they had to get someone in on short notice. That almost paid for the increase in the number of people that they had on staff. Plus, they had a big increase in happiness levels among residents. Um, there were, and they also had the better, essentially better quality of care. So fewer slips and falls, fewer bruises or other injuries, less use of psychotropic drugs, because when you've got people who, you know, residents who have memory issues, having familiar faces around, having routines is really important for their state of mind and sort of their, sort of their sense of identity and their calm. So even in places where you might think, oh, you know, this is just going to cost, this is just going to cost us money. Turns out when you look a little, uh, look a little broader, that even in those cases, it turns out not to be the case. One of the uh, one of the questions that uh, comes up, just with respect to um, you know, when we're talking about this from a from a region wide or a jurisdictional, mm -hmm. so the province of British Columbia, we're we're both MLAs talking about this from a public policy perspective and recognizing that most of the examples, if not all of the examples, other than maybe some civic governments that you just mentioned in the in the book almost all of the examples are of private companies 
uh, a leader within a private company making a decision and then in, engaging the team to, to make it happen. There's no real examples of a jurisdiction or of a region or of a province state saying, okay, let's, let's move to this. Um, at least I haven't got to that point yet if there is. Uh, but I would just say, uh, just the question around, uh, there, was, there was one question that was given to us about okay, how does this fit with school? And then, and then, you know, my job and my kids going to school and then their daycare, if that's not four days, how do, like in the complexity of our society, how do all of these things fit if we're having this conversation uh, at, a, um, at a public policy level rather than at an ind individual business? Can you maybe uh, dig into that a little bit? Sure. Um, the brief answer is that there are some municipalities or regions that have talked about um, creative, creating incentives to, or, uh, to, to attract, attract businesses that operate on four days. No one has really done it yet systematically, and it is a great opportunity waiting to happen. Um, and I think that a systemic approach and a kind of policy would have a couple virtues. One of them is it's a way of solving those kinds of scheduling and coordination issues that you have when, let's say, you know, sort of primary schools go to four day weeks, as a number of them have in the United States. You've got this problem of now the fifth day, you know, where does the, where does the child go? You have to scramble to find childcare sort of for them if you are working that fifth day. You know, likewise, Everybody has to figure out issues around, do you have to redo contracts? How do you handle overtime? What happens with holidays? Every company is kind of having to figure this out for themselves. And I think there is, and so there is, a, and so I think that I don't know of a company that wouldn't like to have some help around those kinds of, those kinds of issues. And then I think as a, you know, as a, there, and I know of a couple places that have talked about the four day week as a tool for, you know, attracting back you know, young professionals from the area who've gone off to the big city you know, to, to establish their careers and, you know, and who maybe at a certain point would like, you know, would like a different life. Um, and would, you know, and could be brought back and could become, you know, and, and could resettle with their businesses. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a drop dead obvious idea, but it's one that no one has yet really put together into, you know, a package of, you know, sort of, of you know, policy slash tax slash, you know, nudges slash whatever. But I think that doing it, you know, there is, it's just a matter of time before we see someplace do this in a systematic way, saying, you know, government, sir, you know, government is going to go to a four-day week, except for essential services, emergency stuff. Schools are going to go to four-day weeks. We'll offer these incentives for businesses to move to a four-day week or for new businesses to come here and to take advantage of this. And here are all of the benefits that will that you know individuals can have that companies can have and that the region can have so you know um it's just that someone's got to go first yeah it, it you know one of the things alex that comes up in this a lot as well is the the notion of like the five-day work week is just that's normal that's natural right. <laughs> can you speak a little bit to how we got to a five-day work week and uh, mm -hmm. why it might not be so natural after all? Sure. Well, you know, this is, and the fact that, you know, the, the world's operating system is sort of runs on a five-day week is something that companies that shorten their hours have to think a lot about, right? Some of them will stagger, you know, sort of uh, will put everyone on a four-day week and have one group working Tuesday through Thursday and another or Tuesday through Friday, another Monday through Thursday, so that for clients and the rest of the world, it looks like it's just business as usual. But the five day week essentially is a kind of political, is a kind of political animal, right? It grew out of the labor movement in the 19th century, um, initially out of calls for 
an eight hour day, the, the chartists I think we're talking about, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for what you will, instead of uh, the 10 or 12 hour days that were, sort of, that were the, the norm in the mid 19th century. The five day week is more of a 20th century invention, but you know, it is something that is very much negotiated by you know, big unions, um, the auto, the steel industry, and to, a, and to some degree also helped along by you know, enlightened, enlightened managers who saw, especially in things like precision industries, like optical, optical manufacturing or munitions, where you can imagine overwork and you know, sort of fatigue could lead to really disastrous mistakes. They found that you know, making people work really long hours for weeks on end was actually counterproductive. Or that in the ninth and 10th hours, if you are you know, assembling telescopes, let's say, that you know, people were making dramatically more mistakes in, that, you know, in hours nine and 10, and it actually required more time to fix them um, that, you know, cost, uh, that cost the company a whole bunch of productivity. So the eight hour day is something, you know, the eight hour day and the five day week are things that um, were, were you know, crafted pretty much a century ago now for different economies and you could argue kind of different times. And there were, and in some parts of the world, the five day week is actually still a fairly new thing, right? China, for example, moved, standardized its working week to five days only in 1995, right? In the, in the middle of its economic boom, it had been a six day work week, they moved to five and a half, and then in 95, down to five days with no impact whatsoever on their economic productivity. And so, you know, for, and so, and I think that, that um, sort of, there is, there is nothing kind of magical or scientific about, about a five day work week. Um, and I think that if we are particularly, if we're able to move, you know, move companies and governments and schools together off of it, then it becomes a lot easier to imagine a future in which, you know, in which people, people are, in which people design their weeks differently. What do you say, uh, we, we've had uh, some questions coming back saying, uh, you know, this is not the right time to be, to be raising this because mm -hmm. of course, you know, COVID is, is challenging uh, all aspects of our economy. We're in an economic crisis. Uh, how, you know, um, a lot of business owners are having trouble seeing how they're going to be able to survive the the former status quo. Never mind now. Uh, now these two greens are throwing this wrench into everything. <laughs> you know, and when, when really, you know, it's not the case. But nonetheless, you know, I think that it is important for us as we as we talk about this and and have this conversation. First, recognizing that I think it's really important for us to to have these conversations, these policy ideas, and put them out there and, and work them through and give them really give them as much of the benefit of the doubt as possible. Mm -hmm. but second of all, what do you say to uh, business owners who say or or folks who say this is unfair uh, on the business community to be having this conversation now? It's going to it's it's going to further hurt us at a time when we could not afford that. So I, the first thing that I would say is that the four day week is something that um, companies adopt during a crisis. It's usually a personal crisis as opposed to a systemic economic one. But, you know, it's, this is, times like these are exactly when this kind of radical experimentation turns out to be necessary. And, you know, in a weird way, when it becomes possible. I think the next thing I would, I would say is that if you want to reopen safely, you know, if you don't want, if you don't want the potential liability of your, you know, of your, your workplace becoming a hotspot, that you should think seriously about, or of, about social spacing, social distancing, that includes playing around with time, right? Combining a four-day week with, you know, flexible work or work from home, 
as a way of having fewer people in the office at any given time, but allowing still for people to, uh, to, you know, to be part of work and to remain productive. For retailers, what I, what I have seen is you know, they go to six hour shifts and governments often will do this as well. You have six hour shifts rather than eight hour shifts and the office stays open for 12 hours. And this allows you know, people to, let's say, bring their car in early in the morning before work and, it, and even major things can be done that same day. So that turns out to be a win both for employees, but it's also a win for sort of the company and for you know and for customers as well. And then I think that the you know the final the final thing I would say is that the odds the odds are that what's going to make you move to a four day week is not some horrible government mandate or you know some consultant in California. What's going to make you adopt a four day week is your competitors because they're, you know, they're going to do it. And it will, you know, if you are an, if you're an incredibly charismatic, successful business person, maybe you can convince someone that you should come, that they should come work for you for five days a week, rather than work for someone else for four. Um, but that's, you know, for most of us, that's a really, really heavy lift. So you know, and then I, the final thing I would say is that the companies that do this have seen improvements in recruitment and retention, work-life balance, productivity and profitability, and sustainability. And I would want to know which one of these right now do you not want to have? Which one of those improvements do you not care about? Um, and then, you know, and if you don't care about them, then five days is definitely the way to go. I think I, I just want to tag one last thing on that, um, Ooh, yeah. since we're talking so much, you know, the, the conversation globally and all the decisions that have been made in the last several months have been about protecting health. Right. And so can you delve in a little bit into what the, the data tells you about the health of the employees and uh, the rates of sick days that are taken when mm -hmm. companies move to this? Um, the, 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 the simple answer is sick days plummet. Um, they go, I mean, I have heard in a number of companies, sick days going down to, you know, single percentages from, you know, from, uh, from numbers that were much, much higher. And partly this is because people are able to take better care of themselves and they are generally healthier. Um, and also, I mean, and so as, uh, as a result of this, because they're able to you know, do things like schedule, uh, schedule visits to the doctor more easily, and people are both healthier and they're able to catch issues sooner than they would otherwise. Um, some of these companies also implement flexible work or work from home at the same time. And so you know, if, you're start, if you feel like you're starting to get sick, you have the freedom to work from home and not infect other people. Um, the other thing that I, the other interesting thing is that companies or workforces that are happier tend to get sick less. Even, you know, they, they actually will, um, there are lower cases of, in, of um, infectious diseases in offices where people, where, uh, sort of where people are, are happier, which sounds kind of nuts that happiness would be, you know, would, you know, would offer some sort of herd immunity against this year's flu. But the statistics actually are really clear that there is something going on there, um, that, there is, that there actually is this kind of herd immunity benefit that um, being more satisfied at work offers. So I think you know, all of, you know, nobody, you know, in the past, nobody has adopted a four-day week in order to help people be healthier. Um, it's been a really great side effect and benefit that's allowed for higher productivity and lower spending on health costs. But I think it's something that, you know, is going to, uh, that, uh, that these days is, you know, something that we should look at more seriously as know, sort of a reason to craft a trial and to try it out. Well, if, uh, if you told me at the beginning in 2017, when Sonia and I got elected, that we would be entering into a legislative session with 24 people sitting in the legislature and the rest sitting on Zoom, I would have told you that that is just simply 
not a, a not an option and will not happen um, because it's never happened before, and so therefore it will never happen in in the BC in in the in the history or the future of the BC Legislature. Um, and you know, lots of things have happened during this 41st Parliament that I think uh, we would have we would have looked to and said that's ah, probably not going to happen. So I think I think one of the things that you know the the this pandemic has has uh, really opened our eyes to is that there are a lot more options in front of us. There are many more options in front of us than perhaps we are uh, prepared to notice uh, at this at this point. And, and they're actually sitting right in front of us right now. We just can't see them because we've got these blind spots, which is the status quo bias. Yeah. It's that's the way it's good. That's the way it happens. So that's the mm -hmm. way it's it's going to happen in the future. So, I mean, I. I I really appreciate uh, that that when we when when this uh, idea got floated and when Sonia floated this idea here and it got caught that, that um, you reached out to us and and connected with us. So, are there, are there any questions? Any other questions here that uh, that uh, we should cover? Sonia, do you have anything else? Maybe something. I, that we've I think it's Alex? just it's been such a a great conversation, and I just want to echo that, Alex. You know, you reaching out to us and and being able to connect with you and have these conversations has mm -hmm. been uh, one of the best outcomes. Uh, it's it's been such a delight to hear about your research and to be connected with these companies and people around the world that are advocating for this. It's uh, I can't thank you enough. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. That's very kind. But you know, I think this is. You know, Part of what's exciting about working on this is that this is a global movement that is only now starting to become aware of itself, right? Mm -hmm. All of these companies doing this have been doing, have been doing it largely in isolation. And the fact that they have, you know, sort of colleagues, you know, in other continents that are doing the same thing, often finding the same solutions, you know, crafting the same strategy, seeing the same benefits, Sort of is a very strong signal that this is, you know, this is a set of changes that are worth making that are available to a very to a wider range of companies than we might have imagined previously. And I think that the you know if there's one good thing that comes out of the pandemic and the lockdown, it is a recognition that things that we thought about business that were absolutely hard and fast turn out to be more flexible, more changeable than we expected. You know, I know a number of managers who previously said, work from home is the hill I will die on. We cannot have this in our business. It just won't work. And it turns out under very stressful conditions, their people made it work. And I think that the, you know, it, it you know, for all of, for all of the bad things that we've had to deal with, you know, I think, we uh, we should see ourselves at a point where um, we don't just have to go back to business as usual, right? And I think likewise that it is, you know, as I said before, it's just a matter of time before some region, some government puts these pieces together and says, you know what, we're gonna try this for everybody and we're gonna see what the benefits are when you move all of these different parts of kind of daily life to a four day schedule um, that you, you know, work, you work to eliminate the common problems that businesses have, figuring out how to make this work. You eliminate the problems that individuals have to solve for themselves around, you know, a disconnect between childcare schedules and work schedules. And let's see what happens when we make it possible for people, you know, for parents, for children, for caregivers, for everyone to work this way. Um, and I think you will see dramatic improvements in quality of life and dramatic improvements in all, in, in all kinds of outcomes and measures for that place. And someone's just gotta be the first to do it. Yeah, I think what's interesting, some of the responses that we've got uh, that, that have come in um, once these ideas were floated here is this isn't gonna happen in this can't this this is not possible for it to happen in my workplace because of X or because of Y and I think um, I really welcome those statements because actually mm -hmm. it's if we know all of the if, if we know all of the reasons why it's just simply not possible for a four-day work week to be implemented in this workplace or that workplace 
those are giving us, it's giving us the information that we need to be able to go and say, okay, how do we make it work in those conditions? Or how do we make it work in, in that situation that it's not possible? That it's, because it, it is possible and we've seen, uh, it wasn't possible before uh, the global pandemic for government to be working from home either. But uh, <laughs> somehow uh, both, the, you know, in, in our experience here in Canada and British Columbia, uh, both the federal and the provincial government worked uh, very well, not, not easily. I, I don't wanna make it mm -hmm. seem like the civil service just made it easy. It, it was very difficult but we may, found a way to make it work in, in a situation where I think prior to it, we would have said it was never gonna be possible. So um, thank you very much for uh, sharing your experience and your, uh, your uh, work, your research work uh, with us and your advocacy. And we're gonna continue to, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that Sonia and I are gonna continue to uh, push, this, uh, push this rock. Hopefully it's not uphill the whole way. Hopefully we can uh, get to the top and push it down the other side and it will get, gather momentum here. And, uh, I hope that uh, that either I or Sonia or uh, or we or the BC government is uh, calling on you to come and visit us and and have a conversation and consult with us on how we can make this happen across uh, the region. Sonia, do you have anything else that you'd like to add here before we shut down? No, I like that uh, image, Adam, of getting the rock to the top of the hill and then it starts rolling down the other side. <laughs> That's a great one. Well, I. Thank you both very much for your interest. And you know, one of the things that I miss most um, over the last few months has been being able to travel. So, you know, the chance to go, uh, the chance to get back out on the road again and actually visit someplace as beautiful as you know as British Columbia would be very, very welcome. So, anytime. We look well, forward Alex, to it. <laughs> Alex, thank you very much, and I'll make sure that uh, your contact details and Sonia's contact details and my contact details are in uh, the Facebook uh, post that uh, that goes along with this video. And uh, really appreciate you taking an hour out of your day to hang out with us here in British Columbia. Thank you to everyone who also chose uh, to be here rather than uh, being somewhere else. It's I'm sitting out on my patio. It is a very nice day and very enticing to go out into it. So. Uh, thank you, and um, all the best to you, Alex, as you continue to uh, advocate uh, yeah. for the four-day work week. And uh, until we reconnect, nice to see you. Awesome. Thank, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you, Sonia. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Alex.